Hello, I'm Steve Paisley. I uh, am the current director of our university research station at uh, UW Sarek, located near Lingle, Wyoming. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of our challenges this year uh, revolving around managing beef cattle, and especially in the dry weather that we've had and some of the challenges that that has posed. So we'll spend a couple of slides and, and kind of go through some ideas and maybe some experiences and some reports that I've heard of local producers in this area. When we talk about uh, farming and ranching, especially in the western states, uh, we know there's a lot of challenges and, and I think we focus on, uh, you know, each individual operation has its own unique challenges. But certainly sustainability is one of our number one goals. And uh, as we go into a dry year or some of those as you start to develop this year, whether it's uh, forage quality, forage availability, uh, animal gains, we've seen a lot of challenges with the number of cattle that are bred up uh, and a lot of open cattle. Uh, all of those issues really impact our individual farmers and ranchers around the area and really impact their sustainability. And, and so I think if we can address some of these issues and kind of talk through what some of these challenges are, I think it's really important from a beef industry standpoint and certainly important to the beef industry in Wyoming. So as we look at some of those challenges this year, especially uh, mainly due to dry weather and uh, actually hot temperatures and some of these other types of things, as we look at uh, going into what we would consider a pretty dry fall and not knowing what the forecast or what our long-term forecast is for us, there's certain things I think we need to consider. Uh, certainly every operation obviously is different and so that's kind of why we're listing some of these individual topics. Certainly looking at the amount of available forage we have to graze, that can impact some of these management decisions. Do we have pastures that we can rotate to or are we extremely limited by the amount of forage that's out there uh, to graze or to utilize uh, with our beef herd? Uh, so that's probably our number one challenge. Availability and prices of feeds. Often these uh, these two issues, available, availability of forage and prices of feeds, kind of go hand in hand, right? If, if everybody's dry, everybody's looking for feed, obviously the prices start to go up. And so what is that availability? Are you able to find some additional feeds uh, to provide to your herd? Uh, what are the prices are? And that's going to determine some of your management decisions. Do we need to call some cows? Do we need to call a little bit deeper? Or can we survive the storm? or survive the drought, as it were, uh, by purchasing feed. I think that's one of the decisions. Additionally, cattle prices and where we're at in the cattle cycle can be a big part of that. Are we looking at uh, the future uh, horizon as far as profitability in cattle? That may determine how many cows you're willing to retain versus uh, maybe selling off some cows, reducing herd size, and addressing it from that standpoint. I think cattle prices can impact that as well. But as we get more into the management of those cattle, uh, looking especially at body condition score is really a critical part of that. And knowing what that body condition is and how we manage cattle according to body condition can be a really important tool. And we talk about body condition all of the time, but I do think it remains one of our most important tools in managing beef cattle. Finally, the last thing is certainly looking at cash flow, and I'll address this a little bit later on. But often we make management, management decisions based on uh, purely whether we can write a check or not. And sometimes those short-term decisions, those decisions to save money by not buying supplement or by not buying additional feed can have long-term impacts on the profitability of our herd, right? So if we have cows that go into calving considerably thinner than we're typically used to, we're going to impact the future uh, breed up or the future pregnancy rates of those cows. We're also probably impacting the quality of those heifer calves that are gestating uh, when we're making those management decisions and that can have long-term impact on our herd as far as their ability to, to breed back for us, uh, the ability to stay profitable in our herd. So all of these things are important to consider, especially going into dry years. So we're going to kind of walk through some of these and maybe some of those things uh, how they will apply to in each individual operation. So as we talk about body condition score, uh, we know it's important to monitor the herd, uh, not at once a year, but certainly throughout the season as a way to maybe avoid problems, uh, maybe to strategically uh, manage body condition so that we can reduce costs 
and improve overall pregnancy rates and improve overall uh, productive efficiency of the herd. So certainly we want to manage those cows uh, from a body condition score and managing those cows based on their stage of production. So we want to match the cow's requirements uh, and match those requirements to forage quality. So for in other words, um, maybe utilize those lower quality feeds uh, earlier in the gestation period or earlier in the winter feeding cycle and save those higher quality feeds as that cow's nutrient requirements increase as they move into late gestation and early lactation. Let's save those higher quality forages and, and feed those when those requirements are higher in the cow. So can we match those harvested forage resources or those purchased feeds and better match that to the cow's requirements as we move through? One way we need to do that is by analyzing feeds, right? Whether we purchase the hay or we produce the hay ourselves, uh, making sure we get a good analysis of that feed can help us develop a balanced ration for those cows. We can better uh, utilize and more efficiently utilize those forages with our cows and hopefully improve overall performance uh, based on the limited amount of forage resources that we have. So balancing the ration, managing those forage resources, and looking at some strategic supplements, all of those things will help us reduce overall feed costs, especially on years like this year, where we've got elevated feed costs and we've got a limited amount of, of grazed forages and we're having to purchase a lot of feed. That's probably our one opportunity to really impact the efficiency and the profitability of our operation is to really hone in on the nutrition of our herd and try and effectively use those resources that we have. One of those tools, again, as we had mentioned before, body condition scoring. Again, it's going to have uh, an important uh, relationship with the overall productivity of our herd. And so we want to look at that relationship between our winter nutrient requirements. It's going to, body condition score will impact our calving success. It has a reflection or a impact on our calf survival as well as colostrum intake. And certainly we know the importance of body condition score at calving how that can have an influence or how that can affect our rebreeding rates in our herd as well as our first service conception rates in our herds. So all of those factors are important from an overall herd sustainability or, sustain, or herd uh, productivity and all of those things related directly to body condition scoring. We talk about body condition scoring quite a bit, but you know we look at it, look at that animal, trying to assess the amount of energy reserves that cow has. So oftentimes, especially in Western herds, where we're using a lot of grazed forages or we've got a lot of uh, native range or, or prairie hay that we feed to our cattle. We know that cattle going uh, into the fall are probably in pretty good shape, but as we work through late gestation, as we move into uh, early lactation, the cow's requirements go up dramatically and often those cows are going to rely on their own energy reserves to get them through to that breeding season or get them through to green grass. So we need to maintain uh, adequate body condition on our cows, we think of a, of a gas tank, right? If we can maintain some energy built up or stored in that cow, that will get us through some of those hard winters and some of those difficult times. So we evaluate several different places on the cow as a way to kind of monitor body condition. So if you look at body condition of a cow, uh, this is some areas that we look at. We obviously look at uh, around the tail head uh, of that cow. We look between the hooks and pins of that animal, look how sharp they are around those hookness, hooks and pins of that cow. We look across their backbone, we look at the smoothness across their backbone. Have they filled in? Do they have adequate cover around their uh, loin eye area, around their back? Uh, we also look, you know, certainly different areas, sharpness of the shoulder, how much fill do they have in their brisket, uh, fullness in their flank, or looking at the rib cage, you know, how many ribs can we count on that animal? You know, all of those are indicators of body condition. Not every cow uh, keeps condition in the same areas. So it's important to kind of keep a mental note of those different areas and kind of uh, use the uh, summation of those areas to try and come up with a body condition score on that cow. So again, just an example of some thinner cows, body condition score three and four. Now remember the ideal body condition is probably a body condition score five in most cases. So here we've got a couple of examples of cows that are below what we would want, especially going into calving. So body condition score three, a cow that's uh, 
you know, pretty thin. She's got an unthrifty hair coat. You see across her top line, really rough across her top line. Her hip bones are real prominent and very sharp. Her front shoulder her, is very sharp. Again, uh, you can count individual ribs, but there's just a general unthriftiness to the body condition score three. Body condition score four, you can still see the sharpness in her hooks and pins. Still a sharpness in her front shoulder. No fill in her brisket, but again, a little bit better hair coat. Again, we will have some cows, especially coming into the fall, uh, coming into weaning, that are body condition score fours. Those are right. We probably want to move those towards a five as we get closer to calving. But again, the body condition score four is kind of more in the general area of where we would like our herd. Now, as we move into a body condition score fives and sixes, again, we like our mature herd to hopefully be around a body condition score four and a half to maybe five as we move into calving. Our first calf heifers, we typically like to have a little more condition on those cows. Again, as they move through the winter, they're going to have higher requirements, so they need to have a little more uh, risk management associated with them, a little more energy reserves as they need it as we go through the winter. But again, pretty smooth across the top line. We're starting to see a little smoothness across their hooks and pins. Um, as you can see in this body condition score six, a little beginning to fill a little bit in the brisket, uh, some fill in the flank. Uh, we can no longer count those individual ribs, real smooth across the top line. Again, an indication of fives and sixes. Now, as we get into body condition score sevens and eights, hopefully we're not managing cattle to this point because we're probably losing efficiency with these cows. Um, they're not earning their keep from uh, that standpoint. Um, so again, these cows are over conditioned in our opinion and that can influence uh, us negatively as well. So again, these cows, once they get into sevens and eights, they start to get a lot of fill around their tail head, a lot of fill in their brisket, a lot of fill in their flank, obviously a little more condition than what we would like to see in a commercial herd. So to kind of summarize body condition scoring, again, it's really the idea of what type of energy reserves are we building into that cow. Uh, we don't have the time today to talk about uh, looking at uh, some ultrasound images, but we can use that to really illustrate that difference between those light uh, or those low body condition score threes and fours versus the fives and sixes. Again, we typically think those low body condition scores, those cows that are in the threes, threes and a half, those cows are having to mobilize muscle to maintain normal bodily functions, right? So they've used up a majority of their adipose. Now they're mobilizing protein, they're mobilizing muscle to maintain those essential body functions. So if you think about that from that cow's requirement standpoint, uh, that's more detrimental to that cow. Obviously, if she has to regain that weight, regain that muscle, that's gonna take longer. Uh, so again, we don't want that cow to, to get too far negative, right? To be too far in the hole, because that's a lot of ground that we need to recover, right? To get that cow back into adequate body condition, we not only have to meet her requirements, but now we've got to supply enough protein and enough energy in that diet to rebuild muscle. So I think that's why it's important to catch and recognize those low body condition scores. To me, that's a whole different scenario than cows that are in higher body condition scores. Once they get above about four and a half, that cow now is mobilizing adipose to uh, allow her weight to fluctuate. We can mobilize fat and we can regain fat a lot easier than we can protein or muscle, right? So again, managing cattle and better condition scores are a really essential tool to reduce your feed costs. If you don't have to feed that muscle back or that muscle gain back onto that animal, you're better off, right? And this whole idea that we keep cows in adequate condition, condition because they've got adequate muscle development, we call those, or I call those kind of simplistically strong cattle. Those cattle that have adequate condition are less prone to injury, are less prone to slipping or, or dislocating a hip, uh, some of those types of things. And they tend to recover better through calving and to tend to make it better through breeding season. And I think we improve the longevity of our cattle if we maintain cows in good, in good body condition. So all of those things we need to think about. If we drop body condition, we get below that critical level, are we exposing ourselves to additional risk? And the answer is probably, in many cases, we are. We may save a little bit of money in the short term by reducing our feed costs, but we may ex expose ourselves to a lot more risk uh, whether or not we get those cattle bred back, how many cows drop out of the herd for lameness or some of these other types of issues. 
And so many times when we look at the whole larger picture or the long-term picture, uh, maintaining body condition is a pretty critical tool. Again, just another way to think about uh, cow requirements as we move through the winter, just a real simple graph showing you that certainly in November, December, uh, maintenance requirements are relatively low. Uh, we can look at that two ways. That cow can manage herself or maintain herself on a pretty low quality diet. But if we know we have thin cows, that's probably our most economical time to add condition to that cow. So strategic supplementation during those fall months will help that cow regain some weight loss. It's a lot easier to put weight on that cow in November and December than it is to recognize thin cows in late March or early April and know that we've got to add additional condition. It costs a lot more hay, a lot more resources to put condition on a cow when her energy requirements are high. So if we can address that earlier in the season when her requirements are low, that's an efficiency that we need to capitalize on. And again, here's just another example of kind of what I showed you in the previous slide, but more from a, uh, a linear or more of a con continuation standpoint. The red line here represents a 1,200-pound cow uh, calving March 1st. And as you see, that last trimester, her requirements go up by about 30% as she gets into calving March 1st. Then that 60 days after calving, her requirements go up by another 30% as her lactation increases. So again, if we think we're trying to breed that cow, often that's about 80 days after calving. Um, so we're trying to breed that animal at our highest energy requirements, right? Here we're expressing it as pounds of TDN. Um, so if you think about this, these blue lines would represent uh, 45, which is a pretty low quality, uh, kind of a straw type of a diet. 50% and 55%. A lot of times our prairie haze and some of our alfalfas can be around 55%. So even if we're feeding a relatively high quality hay, there's a chance that those cows are going to lose condition during that peak energy requirement, right? So that's the importance of having them in good body condition score at calving because we know we want to have adequate condition getting into breeding. So we want to have that cow in good shape going into calving because we know she may be spending some of her own reserves uh, to get through that lactation curve. So again, um, thinking about those energy requirements and how that impacts the quality of hay you deliver to that cow, as well as quantities, is pretty critical or pretty important. And just a quick thing, you know, we've talked about this slide already, but if you think about those first and even second calf heifers that are in the herd, Often they will come in the fall if they wean their first calf. They tend to come into the fall uh, thinner uh, than our mature cows. And then if you think about their requirements as we move in towards calving and through lactation, those cows per pound of body weight have actually a higher requirement than those larger mature cows because those growing cows have that additional growth requirement that's going to impact them. So they're smaller uh, than those mature cows. Again, if they're going up to the feed bunk, they're the ones getting pushed out of the way because they're 200 pounds lighter than those mature cows. But yet their requirements are actually higher. So that's why we often talk about sorting the herd, uh, trying to put those younger cows and maybe thinner cows together and managing them separately. And, but certainly addressing those cows and making sure that we've got that condition on those first and second calf heifers, making sure they stay in our herd is important. All right, just a quick slide here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we strategically look at body condition score. And in our spring calving herds, we know that certainly weaning time is a chance to kind of take a snapshot because if we need to address anything particular as far as body condition, uh, it's most economical to increase condition after weaning, right? So we can address that if we've got a snapshot in time of what their condition is at, at weaning. Uh, certainly other times that we look at as we move closer to calving, obviously uh, body condition score at calving, it's a little late to address any management things there, but oftentimes it's important to think about that and, and as we move into breeding season, recognizing maybe what challenges lie ahead from a breeding season standpoint. If we know we've got thin cows going into calving, then making sure we address that in our management approach to breeding season and try and get those cattle rebred. Uh, all of these are times to evaluate uh, body condition. We may or may not be able to address those things, but it's certainly important to recognize uh, what's going on and what may, may be impacting some things like rebreeding rates, uh, calf survivability, 
some of those types of things. All of those things can be influenced or can be directly related to body condition. And a lot of these things, body condition can help tell the story. All right, so just kind of in, a, in wrap up just a little bit is to look, you know, how do we address is our cow getting enough requirements? So in this case, I'm going to use an example. This is a university cow uh, from our university herd. This is a picture taking at an early weaning time. So this was actually a mid-August picture taking of some of our uh, university cows. And so we're going to walk through with this particular cow. So I circle her in this picture. I know what her tag number is. So because I know her tag number, I know what her weight is. And we're going to walk through what her requirements are and maybe how we can address that through our management to make sure we maintain condition on that cow. All right, so that cow is number, tag number 2230, seven-year-old cow in this picture. Uh, she weighs 1,465 pounds. And as you can see over here on the right-hand side of this equation, if we look at her mid-gestation or when her requirements are lowest, we have TDN, protein, and calcium levels here. But as we get closer to late gestation, again, we talk about that 30% increase in energy and protein requirements. As we move down through there, we see that while we can meet her requirements in mid-gestation or in the fall, as we move into winter and we move closer to calving and even uh, post-calving, her requirements go up pretty dramatically. As you can see, we double our protein requirement. We almost double our energy requirement as we move that way. So recognizing those changes in that cow are pretty important. Again, just a quick snapshot here. One way we address that is to make sure we uh, sample and analyze all of our forage resources. This is a sample uh, out of my own stackyard. I get the uh, benefit or the opportunity to manage a lot of western wheatgrass on my own particular ranch. And so we look at, you know, all of these types of things. So we certainly, if I'm able to put up hay, I'm going to get an analysis on it. As you can see, even though I tried to do a pretty good job of, of harvesting this western wheatgrass in June, uh, when there's still some nutritive value in that forage, we still see that it's only 6% protein uh, and that our TDN is around 54, 55%. So certainly that that's something that poses some challenges from a management standpoint. And it's important to know that this hay looks extremely green in the stackyard. And certainly the greenness of that hay is not necessarily an indication of the quality of that hay. And it's important to get them all sampled and analyzed so we can balance a diet. All right, so if we choose to feed that hay, um, and this is that same cow, our number 22, 30. Uh, so we say we feed 40 pounds of hay to that cow. We know well and probably on all uh, honestly she probably only gets um, maybe 90 percent of that that we deliver. So if we feed 40 pounds to that cow she's probably going to get 35. Uh, wind's going to blow away some of that. They're going to walk or trample or or defecate on some of that hay. So they're probably not going to get all of that 40 pounds. So if we know um, we feed maybe she gets 35 pounds of hay we convert that to a dry matter standpoint. She's getting about 31 pounds of dry matter. If we multiply that by 55% uh, TDN hay, we know that at the peak of uh, lactation, uh, even with a medium quality uh, hay, uh, we're still meeting not we're not meeting our energy requirements. We're still short about a pound and a half of TDN. From the protein standpoint, same kind of a story. I'm um, not using the ex previous example, but even if our prairie hay is 8% protein, uh, we're still missing or not meeting that protein requirement by half a pound. So the question is, what can we do? We've got that forage resource in our stackyard. What are some of our options to getting that cow fed properly? So a couple of things to really point out what's important here. Having some idea of the size and weight of our cows, uh, knowing what our production cycle is or our production scenario and then knowing what the actual forage resource we have and the forage quality that's in there that helps us build a balanced diet and know where our shortcomings are in our base forage we can fill in those gaps with a supplement uh, it might be supplemental alfalfa it might be a supplement like a, a commercial cake or it might be some type of byproduct feed we can fill in those gaps and make sure we not only keep condition on that cow but we make adequate 
uh, utilization of that forage and we improve our efficiency or our utilization of that forage that we already have. All right, again, just some different examples. And again, this really is trying to illustrate the idea that you need to match your feed with your particular situation. So for example, when this previous cow, we know that we're one and a half pounds short on energy. Uh, if we fed corn, we would need to feed about 1.7 pounds of corn. But to meet her protein requirement, now we've got to feed five and a half pounds. So uh, she's, she's deficient on protein. We're probably not going to accomplish that with feeding corn, right? So we need to look at some other higher protein sourced feeds to get at that, whether it's a distiller's grain, a soybean meal, or a range cube, something like that. We need to make sure we meet those deficiencies with that supplement and we do it cost effectively. All right, just kind of winding down here, the important thing to look at and, and pricing. So if we know we need to provide protein to our herd, making sure we're pricing that on a per pound of nutrient standpoint. All right, so we've got two examples here. We've got a 20% range cube, 20% protein that's all natural at $380 a ton versus a supplement that's 32% protein, all natural, but it's a higher price. It's $480 a ton. As you walk through this math, you see that certainly Although the 20% cubes are cheaper per ton because there's only 360 pounds of protein in that ton of feed, if you price it out on a per pound of protein standpoint, we're paying a little over a dollar per pound of protein in that 20% cube. You do the same calculations with that 32, even though it costs more per ton, $480 a ton, when you price it out per pound of protein, which is our critical nutrient, we see that we're only spending 83 cents per pound of protein for the 32s. So even though it costs more per ton, we're more cost effective with that higher protein supplement that's going to do a better job for us if we're interested in supplementing with protein in the herd. So pricing those supplements out on a per pound of nutrient required is really a critical step in that process. So just in summary, you know, as we look at those supplements, make sure we know what their prices are, know what their nutrient analysis is, how does that fit into our scenario, does it meet the needs that we need, does it fill those gaps that are important to us from our herd standpoint, and can we do it cost effectively. So pricing those feeds or those supplements per pound of nutrient are pretty important, and making sure we evaluate them on, on a level playing field. So making sure we're pricing those things out and comparing them per pound of nutrient is a critical step in management during dry years. All right, just a kind of a simple slide here describing uh, if we do de develop a supplement or come up with a supplement, we need to balance those, those diets and make sure we're providing adequate uh, nutrients to that cow. It's a balancing act. We need to, to get that optimum performance. We need to balance that energy and protein to make sure we're getting the op optimum benefit out of that ration. So again, just quickly, and, and we can you know certainly address this more and another time, but if we think about those supplement scenarios, you know, if we're limited in protein, uh, we need to provide some protein to balance that diet, right? So if our overall uh, diet or our overall situation is protein limited, we need to look at those protein supplements, find those protein supplements, price them out per pound of protein, and we need, we know there's a great benefit. So even when we provide on a low protein uh, basal diet, if we supplement with protein, uh, we're going to get a boost in performance, we're going to get a boost in intake, and we're going to improve the overall uh, energy status of that cow. So again, different scenarios, and usually this, you know, winter or late summer on low quality haze, that's when we need to think about a protein supplement. On the flip side, there are situations where uh, we are limited by energy. We may have adequate protein, but we're limited in energy. Uh, so in those cases, maybe it's a completely different supplement that we need to be thinking about. Uh, there are instances where we're trying to maximize performance on high quality or early spring growth. We know those diets are relatively low in protein, but are really high in energy. Other scenarios include maybe during lactation where we know we're maybe feeding some type of uh, higher protein feed. Maybe it's an, an alfalfa blend. Uh, so we're maybe meeting their protein requirement, but because we're at the peak of lactation, we may not be meeting their energy uh, requirement. So we need to make sure we understand what nutrient is limiting 
and making sure we balance and manage accordingly. All right, so just kind of a summarization here. We want to maximize forage utilization. We talked about doing that strategically through supplementation. And if we do it correctly, if we balance that diet, we're going to improve overall digestibility. We can utilize those supplements and placement of supplements to improve overall grazing distribution. And through all of this process, if we do it strategically, we're going to match the feed resources to that cow's need. And we're going to reduce waste. We're going to reduce that inefficiency. We're going to have an animal that uh, we accomplish more with our limited feed resources. All right, again, just kind of a summary slide is we need to know certainly several things about that cow and about the situation in order to make sure we are providing the correct amount of feed, right? So we've already kind of hit on these things, but again, the two main legs that we require or, or uh, testaments that we need to balance uh, for that cow is to sample forages and determine the quality of what forage resources that we have and try and match those feeds to that cow's particular metabolic needs moving through that production cycle. All right, just one uh, last thing to kind of talk about, and this typically comes up during really dry years, but you know, sometimes we manage things to reduce costs and reduce out-of-pocket expenses. That kind of comes up during dry years where we've got limited forage and our bank account's already depleted, right? So we go into a situation where our cows are somewhat thin. We don't have a lot of uh, cash in our account. So we do the short-term thing. We, we like, well, maybe we can, we can limp through this particular period. Uh, we're going to try to reduce costs by reducing our overall supplements, or we're not going to buy that amount of feed. That's going to have an impact on body condition of that cow. And as we talked about before, some of these short-term decisions to make ends meet may have a negative long-term impacts on the herd. So by choosing not to supplement, or to bring cows into calving at a lower body condition, now we're impacting the, the fertility of those future calves that are produced that are in gestation. Um, a lot of research would indicate if we don't provide adequate uh, nutrient to that animal during the late gestation, we're gonna impact that heifer calf, her subsequent productivity. So again, we wanna be able to address not only the future productivity of that heifer calf that's being born, but we also want to maintain the herd and make sure we've got adequate condition in that herd, that we get ad adequate rebreeding rates and we get good health and survivability of those calves. So they can have long-term impacts. Those short-term decisions can have long-term impacts. So we want to think about that as we make some of those management and some of those nutritional decisions with our herd. All right, that's the end of my presentation. I appreciate uh, everyone's attention. Um, let's make sure uh, if you have any questions at all that I'm more than willing to visit with you or talk to you, I've got my email address here posted as well as my cell phone number. So you, uh, if you want to discuss anything or have any additional questions, please feel free to contact me. All right, thank you.